morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here and speak to this audience. My work has been mostly from, from the firm side, so it's going to be a different perspective for you. But basically, my goal today is to try to give you a perspective of what it is to be the starter of one of these platforms, or what it is to be an incumbent who's thinking of a platform, incumbent being you know, large firms that actually have pipeline businesses and that actually want to go into a platform business because it just makes much more sense in uh, today's world. But but there are many challenges in this, and my goal is to explain these challenges and to, to show you a way forward. Because as we know, platforms really matter, and uh, they create many synergies between people and, and uh, companies. So, before we start, the first thing that I want to talk about is to explain a few um, technology trends in order to give you a sense of where platforms fit. We know that many businesses are being disrupted and by platforms. And in fact, ICT predicts that 30% of large enterprises will be disrupted by this year. That's a very large number. The second trend that we see is that different businesses that had nothing to do with one another are now coming together. We see that everywhere. We see that, you know, especially in the sector of technology and other services, but we see finance coming together with, uh, you know, with healthcare. We see technology affecting all of these sectors and converging them into one large sector, where, in a sense, we have one platform where we do all of our services, whether it's finance and healthcare, etc. This is a big trend that we see. Why is there this trend? The main reason is because data analysis has advantages. Those who have access to data, those who can analyze that data better, end up creating a, an advantage for themselves. And there are many startups today in all sorts of fields that are really banking on being able to give you better services because they can analyze your data better. Which of course brings the question of, who does the data belong to, which is a very important issue, which we will see later. And of course, all of this, the convergence of industries and the, the technology that, that connects all of these different services end up creating a situation which is per a perfect storm, in a sense, for the rise of platform businesses. Platform businesses matter. And as you can see, platform businesses become hugely successful. And we'll talk about the reasons for that. But if you see kind of a rough comparison of, let's see if this works, it does, Uber versus BMW, you know, you know, think of it from a customer's point of view. Actually, I'll tell you a personal story. Last year, there was this unusual snowstorm in the UK, and one of our cars got totaled because it skidded off the road and we hit a wall. So when our car was gone and it was not repairable, we thought, okay, could we survive on Uber? You know, now that the car is gone, what, why don't we try? And in fact, until today, we don't have a second car because it was perfectly possible to replace our car with Uber. And so looking at whether or not that we were going to buy a BMW, but um, comparing BMW to Uber, you can see that Uber doesn't own any cars and yet is much more successful in terms of market capitalization. You could say the same thing about Marriott versus Airbnb. Airbnb doesn't own any real estate, and yet you know, it has way surpassed the biggest hotel chains in the world. The other comparisons are a bit less relevant in the sense that you, know, you, you need to think of Walt Disney versus Facebook in terms of content providers and see that Facebook actually doesn't create content, and yet it is much more successful in the market. What does this tell us? It tells us that platforms scale much better and that they take over other businesses. They disrupt industries. When we look at platforms across different industries, in fact, what we see is that the largest companies, the most successful companies in terms of the percentage of growth uh, in, uh, uh, compared to prior year, many of these firms are platforms. Some of them are very clear for you, probably. Apple, for example, would be a platform, SAP, HP, Facebook, etc. But if you actually look at their business models closely, you see that 13 of them are platforms. And in fact, there's BMW and Mercedes there, which are looking into becoming platforms by 
going into autonomous connected electric vehicles. So it's everywhere. Whichever industry you go to, there's a disruption by platforms. And in fact, comparing just over 10 years, the biggest companies, we had Microsoft, yes, you know, platform, but then we had Coca-Cola and Marlboro, etc. And when we go just two years back now, all of the top five are platforms. Why does this happen? It happens because it reduces transaction cost. It connects people in a way that is much easier than me trying to go and buy something on my own. Search costs and transaction costs are reduced. And it makes it able also to scale up because it's much easier for users and suppliers to join the platform. And so it makes sense that this is the prominent business model that we see. Platforms also made certain companies very successful. This is Apple in 1996. This is not a success, let's say, front cover. The fall of an American icon. So I'm sure that a lot of you remember the, the original Macintosh computers. And so these, that was one of my first computers, actually, and it was a very good one. Compared to the IBM at that point, it was just so easy to use and so much more compact and just a great product overall. Which creates a puzzle for me. You know, why is it that this, a company like this that had a great product can fail so miserably? After this uh, business week covered, they actually came to the brink of bankruptcy. And then Steve Jobs came back and turned the company around. Interestingly, the reason even back in 96 or in the mid 90s for Apple's failure was a platform reason. After Apple entered the market, IBM realized that something bad was going to happen. So they said, okay, we're going to change our business strategy. And what we're going to do is we're going to invite hardware and software developers in the world as third parties onto our computer. How are they going to do that? They published all the specs for what you should do in order to produce a, a printer, in order to produce speaker phones, you know, in order to uh, produce um, uh, whatever, a software for architecture or music. Once people had these specs, everybody could be a contributor to the IBM computer. What does that do? Imagine that you're all, you know, trying to make some money, either, you know, trying to code hardware and software or trying to make hardware. And suddenly IBM says, look, you can do it for this computer. And some of that, pro some of those products are going to be embedded when we sell the computer and others can be bought in the market. Well, that's great because now we can all be part of the same platform. And whenever I buy a computer, I can choose if I'm an architect or a musician, whatever I am, I can find the necessary software and hardware. After IBM changed strategy into a platform strategy, Apple really struggled. Why? Because they had kept the system closed. So more and more, everybody was connecting to each other through these software. Imagine that you know, you're trying to get some business done and then your colleague has a Macintosh that cannot talk to your computer. More and more people made choices in order to be able to connect to everyone else for primarily connection, you know, communication and work purposes. And so, although the Macintosh computer was much better in many ways, IBM took over. There were some comparisons between them in terms of when they invest $1 million into their new, let's say, operating system, how long does it take for IBM versus Apple to get that money back? In the 90s, late 90s, it took IBM two months to get $1 million back. Whereas for Apple, the same kind of investment, because they also had to invest into all of those things, it took them five years. And so you can imagine how fast a company can run out of money when they close themselves, in a sense, to the platform business model. So then the interesting thing is Apple is not a failure case today, or you know, mostly not, I would say. And so comparing it to just four years after, in the year 2000, this product comes along, the iPod. Granted, the iPod is not the first music player, MP3 player in the market. 
In fact, at that point in time, I had a Sony MP3 player, which was as thin as my index finger and had a horizontal screen and it was beautiful. I was clipping it to my shirt. Great product. It held 100 songs, but you know, that was enough. In fact, many people think that it's not the characteristics of the iPod that made it a huge success. It's something else, which is the iTunes. Because the iTunes was a platform that for the first time in the world got all of the record players together. Before that, what was happening? Do you remember those times when, you know, your choices were either to buy a CD with, you know, 15, 17 songs and then only listen to two of them because the rest were crap? That was the business model of the record player, right? So when the business model of the incumbent is to try to sell you things that, you know, as a customer that you don't want, then somebody's going to disrupt you. And in fact, that disruption came from Apple. They went and said, look, you know, I made the mistake of having a really closed uh, platform before, but the advantage of a closed platform is actually quite secure. So therefore, let me use my expertise in security to create a platform for you guys where you provide the content and I sell it. And of course, I take a bit of money on the side. So the iTunes is really Apple's attempt at understanding and mastering the platform business model. And it didn't stay at iTunes and iPod. When the first iPhone came out, it was very much based on the same thing. Very quickly after the release of the iPhone, the application store came along. And as we know, you know, there's many uh, streams of research on the application store. That is one of, one of the biggest platforms in the world today. So Apple itself had to learn the, that the, the value of the platform business model the hard way. But today they are the masters of it. Another interesting story. This is this one is based on my own research. Is the the um, mobile payments market. So when I'm sure that a lot of you today uh, use Apple Pay or Samsung Pay, something Pay, right? In fact, the technology that is embedded into that, which is something called near field communications technology (NFC), is a technology that existed since the 90s. If you travel to London in the 90s, you would have used an Oyster card already. That Oyster card already was tap and go. And that Oyster card was based on that NFC technology. Now, the technology existed since the 90s. When did you first start using Apple Pay? How many years? Two years, three years? Yeah? Okay, two years, three years. In fact, it came to the market around 2014, 2015. There's almost 20 years difference between the mid 90s and 2014, 2015. 20 years of delay for the commercialization of this product, which a lot of us like. And the idea, in fact, was really visionary. The idea already in the 90s was we're going to make people leave their wallets at home. We're going to make the phone, although the phone looked like that at that time, we're going to make the phone your main device. At some point, it's going to start to open your door, etc. And all of those things are happening today. But why the delay then? In a research study, we looked at why mobile payments took so long, and we realized that it was a platform reason. The platform in mobile payments is a bit more complex because there's the digital platform where the payments are happening, where the finance data is integrated as well as the merchant data, and then it's based on um, hardware that supports that platform. And there are many players that need to be there. So you need to have a phone, obviously, mobile payments, and you need a chip in it, which, you know, makes sense. You need the merchant, meaning, say, McDonald's, to, to put that device there for you to tap into. And then, obviously, you need, you know, people like Mac McDonald's in order to make this happen. And then you also need software that makes that payment possible. But most importantly, you need someone who, to have a bank account, have some sort of a card, credit card, debit card, as well as what? They need to have phone service, right? Because it happens over data. So all of these players, when they came together, there was one problem, which was that mobile operators, the, the likes of AT&T and Vodafone and KPN, and the banks actually were the kings in their industry back then. This is pre-iPhone. 
This is when you, you know, downloaded everything, including music and games, etc., from your operator. And so the operator said, look, this is my service. And the bank said, you can't do anything without the card. This is my service. We followed their negotiations for a long while. The first disagreement that we saw is that they couldn't agree on who owned that customer. The mobile operator said, look, the, the platform is the device. And that device belongs to me. Because people buy it from me. So therefore, I'm not going to make it look like a NASCAR with all those logos on it. You're not going to put your logo on it because this is my service. You're a backbone enabler. The bank said, this is just an extension of my services onto a new medium, a new platform. It doesn't matter who owns that platform. This is an extension of my service, and nobody is going to change their bank account in order to make mobile payments. So therefore, you're stuck with me. They couldn't agree, and then they finally said, let's, uh, let's get a third party in in order to be the front to the customer, but they even couldn't agree on who should be a neutral third party. Complete, as they say in negotiation theory, complete impasse. They walk away. Second situation is that they actually also couldn't agree on security standards. As you can imagine, banks actually have a security priority and, you know, many people say, I don't trust my bank for looking out for my interests, but I trust them for, for security reasons. Our data, our money is secure there. And so banks wanted to impose the security on a different, um, onto a different uh, actor, and that actually backfired as well. What happened? Banks went to their own corners and said, if mobile payments are a no-go, then I'm going to put that same chip into a plastic card. That's why today you have all those contactless cards. Those cards were not supposed to happen. We were supposed to jump to the telephone, to the, to the mobile, but it actually wasn't possible due to these turf wars. And of course, mobile operators had a more difficult time because they had to do SMS payments. And don't, let's not get into SMS payments. Those are very, very painful. You, in order to get a, you know, a bottle of water, you have to send a text to your operator. The operator sends a text to the merchant. The merchant it releases the water to you, you know, because you have to type in that code, etc. By that time, you're dead. So therefore, complete failure and Guess who does mobile payments today? Any of these guys? Those who connect parties that don't agree, just like in the case of iTunes, record players couldn't get together. They were all going to do their own platforms. Am I going to go for, to, to Sony for Michael Jackson and you know, to EMI for Beyonce? No, of course not. There needs to be one platform. And so Apple solved this problem by saying, OK, you guys don't agree. I'm going to provide the platform, and you're only complementers at this point, nothing more. I take the money. Now, these are stories of how platforms really involve power struggles between firms. And sometimes these platforms don't even emerge because of that, or somebody else actually takes the market and runs. Now, finally, I have a current story for you, which is how platforms are coming into banking. Banking and healthcare are regulated, data-sensitive industries. These are the industries that a lot of times are expected to be protected from these kinds of pressures. But it turns out that actually, this is now happening even in the banking sector. In a study that we've been conducting since 2016, we've been looking into the particular effects of a revolutionary regulation in banking. Let me tell you in very simple terms what this uh, new regulation is. The regulation is called Open Banking, or PSD2 in Europe. It's actually one of those few pieces uh, of regulation where the UK and Europe agree, which is wonderful. Now, what happens with this regulation is that it actually says something quite fundamental. It says that all that data that you've been building in a bank by transacting in many different ways, that data belongs to you, not to the bank. What does that mean? It means that if you want someone else to offer you services by analyzing that, your data and customizing that service to you because you make certain kinds of payments and not others, etc., then you should be allowed to do so. 
So therefore, we're going to create a system where the banks actually have to give data to the third-party apps if you give your consent to them. The purpose is to level the competitive field, to say newcomers should have a chance in providing financial services, because otherwise this monopolistic situation leads to lack of innovation in the market. And in fact, you know, as we all know, our banks are not incredibly innovative. Even trying to log on to online banking takes five minutes, right? So the idea of providing innovation in this market has been very welcomed by everyone. And in fact, since 2015, the announcement of the regulation, many of these third parties have come in and created a situation where it's a true head-on war between banks and what we call fintechs, financial technology firms, which are the startups that are coming into this market. We've been collecting data from these different players since 2016, with uh, over 100 interviews in the UK and EU with incumbent banks, so the likes of ABN AMRO and, and um, Barclays and ING and all of those, challenger banks, you might have heard of N26, Monzo, Starling, those guys. And then fintechs, the complementers on these platforms that are coming in, and of course, industry analysts. What we have built is a typology of what it means for an incumbent to build a platform versus a newcomer. What does a platform look like in the case of uh, banking? A platform for finance could be as simple as something like Amazon. Imagine that you go to Amazon and depending on what you need, you do uh, different searches, right? You want different products and sometimes not even products, but also services. You want to listen to music, you go to Amazon. You want to watch a movie, you go to Amazon. You want to read a book, you go to Amazon. It's actually kind of scary how much you go to Amazon. So it's, it can be exactly like that. And that was very much the idea that you go onto a platform and you shop around for different services. The data gets transferred to those players that you want to work with, and they can provide you a better mortgage. They can provide you a credit card with a better deal based on analyzing your data. Now, how do banks respond to this? How does your bank, and I'm pretty sure that you all have a big bank that you work with because we're really kind of, uh, we want to feel secure with our money, right? So. The question for big banks was, how do I build this kind of platform and what do I put on it? My own products or do I shop around? Whereas for a challenger bank, the question is a little bit different. I can build a platform, I have the technical skills, but how do I grow it? How do I get customers onto it because I'm a new player? And also, how much do I make myself because that costs money? And to what extent do I invite others to compete on my platform and kind of go to my corner and just provide the platform? The first thing that we looked at is the incumbent bank. Incumbent banks are known as the fortresses. They protect everything. But on the flip side, they don't do anything with what they have inside, meaning your data and your money just stay there, right? But we're happy because everything is secure. Right now, I think I have something like 0.1% uh, interest on my savings account with my bank, which is not that great. But, but I don't change it because I'm inertial. I, I actually want to feel secure with my money, right? So when incumbents start to do platforms, something very curious happens. It turns out that their IT structure is actually one where they have built these pillars, these silos over the decades. Why? Because when they wanted to add mortgage products on top of, you know, they all started with these current accounts, debit accounts. When they wanted to add something like credit, they built a separate IT in order to not disrupt the debit. Then came mortgages, separate IT. You don't want to disrupt what's going on over there because customers freak out if you do. And by the way, governments also fine you if you do. So over the decades, they created these silos of products and IT pillars that don't talk to one another. That's why if you call your bank and say, you know, I, I, I want to change something like my address, they try to sell you mortgage while you actually have a mortgage from them because they don't see that information on a platform. 
So now when that happened and when they put these profit maximizing managers on top of these IT pillars for different products, they created a situation of perfect kingdoms without, you know, but each kingdom being completely removed from one another. And each kingdom putting their data somewhere safe and not looking at it. In fact, one of our informants said, data is like a biohazardous waste for us. We want to contain it. We don't want to look at it. We want to contain it. That is a very different attitude compared to a platform attitude where data is your first asset. Many of the fintechs that we interview say, my first concern is how do I get to data? Regulation also doesn't help. It turns out regulators regulate those parties that they know. When they don't know the fintechs, they say, if a fintech and a bank work together, I'm going to go to the fintech. And in fact, current law says that the bank, the big bank, has to take care of all of the transactions and show that if there's a security breach, that it wasn't the bank's fault. So it's not innocent until proven guilty. It's guilty until proven innocent, right? which creates a situation where the bank actually really doesn't want to work with anyone because they come after what they know. What they know is how to regulate a bank. And so the banks shy away from creating platforms where they collaborate with these fintechs. So the NASCAR comes back in this case too, because when the bank works with a really cool fintech, they say, I don't want your logo on there. This is my app. And so I'm not going to turn it into a NASCAR. Working with fintechs, this is an actually quote, working with fintechs is something that they want to do. And they, a lot of people call this the innovation theater. They announce all these things where I work with a fintech, you know, we're going to do great services. Before those services come to the market, the fintech runs out of money because it takes two years in order to even sign a contract with a bank. So for all these reasons, the banks are struggling to build platforms. What do they do instead? They try to buy them. But when you buy a platform, you don't change your culture. And so you have this platform, but your attitude of being closed up actually really continues, which means that it's very difficult for these guys to offer competitive platforms, even though they can buy the technology itself. Now the fun part of the story, which is the challenger banks. And in fact, they really look like this. Right? These are the startups that are trying to disrupt the market. And here are some of the real faces of these guys. You might have heard some of these firms. And what they do is provide you Amazon-like marketplaces, like the one in the middle. This is an actual financial marketplace. What they struggle with is something different. They don't have the brand name, so they can't get you as a customer. Not only that, but even if you sign up, which many of you might, you won't put your savings or your pensions into it because we don't, we don't want to play it risky, right? So it's not just about the acquisition, but also how much money is turning around on these platforms. It's very little. How do they try to solve that problem? A lot of times they actually go into just providing the technology themselves. Sometimes they try to go international, but the problem is that pensions in Germany and pensions in the UK are a completely different thing. So a lot of these complementers actually cannot work across these different platforms. So it's like carrying a Christmas basket, but every time you go to a new country, you have to get the local cheese and wine, right? It's a lot of effort. It's much easier for a local guy to do it. And so internationalization is an issue. And of course, turning it into a three cycle platform as well getting more players to agree with you because you don't have a brand name yet in the market. So compared to Amazon that started from nothing and no brand name and grew into this kind of huge scale, it's a lot harder in banking because getting the customers is very difficult, which means that there's a chicken and egg problem. If you don't get customers, then you don't get the fintechs because the fintechs, in order to agree with you, look at whether you have customers. They need the data. If you don't have customers, you don't get the fintechs. When the fintechs don't come, then your platform is empty. When the platform is empty, customers even more so don't come. And so the chicken and egg problem continues, and it's very difficult for these guys to scale up. They also have trouble with resources and IT because it costs a lot of money to build a platform and at the same time get all sorts of financial licenses. So a lot of times they rent, these, uh, they rent this technology from others, 
from such as big banks. However, when that happens, the transition into your own IT actually causes a dis disruption. This is an actual um, title from a business insider last year. Some of the UK's hottest fintechs went down, including Monzo and Revolut. Went down meaning you couldn't access your accounts for an entire weekend. That is a problem that actually makes customers even less sure about joining these platforms. All of these things together create a situation where, let me skip this one, getting too specific into APIs, creates a situation where fintech startups really struggle because they don't get your trust and they don't have enough resources. Big banks struggle because they have the silos and it's very difficult for them to reshape themselves, restructure themselves in order to start building platforms. When they try to buy a platform, then the culture actually becomes a roadblock in making this platform competitive and interesting for the customer, which creates a situation where new entrants, such as Amazon and Google, have a great opportunity to grab this market. Why? Newcomers can't do it. Incumbents can't do it. When incumbents try to acquire newcomers, they can't do it because you need a brand name and you need the tech itself. Well, guess what? Amazon and Google have both. And so, interestingly, when the regulators created this regulation in order to make the competitive field more level for newcomers to, to be able to offer you services, they opened it up for the big five tech platforms to take over the market. And, create, and for, the, for these tech platforms to have an even bigger monopoly. And in fact, you see that Google already offers banking services in the US, Amazon does lending to small to medium businesses, Apple has a card now, a brand new shiny card, and this guy is kind of struggling. But uh, let's see what, they still have lots of money to do interesting things in finance. And in fact, in the US, they are trying to put Messenger as the main payment platform between people and it's working to a great degree. So, it's like musical chairs, as someone described. Finance is the new game, and everybody's trying to grab a chair, and most of these chairs are going to go to big tech platforms. Takeaways. Power struggles keep people from grabbing the same stick and running together, unfortunately. Not only power struggles, but IT structures get in the way. And this is why a lot of times, if you're not a platform business yourself, it's very difficult to turn yourself around. Many of the big banks have announced these huge IT restructuring projects, 1 billion, 2 billion pounds, euros, in order to turn your IT around. Because before that, you cannot do anything related to platforms. And finally, regulators, without intending to do so, are inviting these uh, big platforms into different sectors. The same is happening in healthcare. We were just looking into some healthcare dynamics yesterday with a colleague, and we realized how Amazon is taking that over as well. Whereas Google is going into education, regulated data sensitive markets, and big tech platforms coming into that as well. So with that, I know that this is a gloomy picture, but at the same time, this is something that, and I know that there's a lot of policymakers as well as, as, as startups in the room. It's very important for us to realize these dynamics because sometimes markets that seem to be opening up may actually be subject to certain dynamics that make it very difficult for startups to survive there. What might be a good strategy for, for a startup to either work with one of these uh, tech firms or to actually try to create, help a bank early on to to create a platform in order to protect the market, if this is the intention, to protect the market from monopolistic players. With that in mind, and you know, the tech giants, and there's lots of talk, and Europe is in the forefront in terms of uh, whether these tech giants should be broken up and not uh, be allowed to go into all these sectors. Lots of thoughts to think about, but with that in mind, I'd like to thank you and open it up to questions.